Good afternoon. We are here at the Morse Institute Library in Natick, Massachusetts. It's May 27, 1998, and today we're interviewing Mr. Richard P. Tafe of Chelmsford, Massachusetts. Dick is a unique interviewee in that he was involved in the service during World War II, the Korean conflict, and the Vietnam War. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Glad to be here. Thank you. Um, as I mentioned, we did discuss earlier some questions. I will be repeating them for you. And we do know that your nickname is Dick. And if you don't mind, we'll call you Dick Tate throughout the interview. And what is your age, Dick? 78, gratefully. And your current marital status? I am divorced, widowed for the last two years and four months. And you have children? I have three. And what are their backgrounds? Pauline, the elder, is a librarian at the UMass Hospital Library in Worcester. Dick Jr. is a public relations editor slash senior consultant for a high-tech firm in Cambridge. And Michael is the vice president of Pivot Point, a high-tech company in Woburn. And you have grandchildren? I have four of those. Um, Emily and Megan are Michaels, and uh, Sarah and Tommy are his wives. And where were you born? I was born in Newton. In Newton. Moved to Natick when I was five, and East Natick. Oak Street, I understand. Both ends, as a matter of fact. I lived in the big house beside the fire station before the war. After the war, I moved into one of the Louis Rudnick houses up in Oak and Pine Street. What was it like growing up in Natick? It was a fascinating town. Everybody knew everyone else. The streets were mostly dirt, some of them covered in tar and rolled with a steamroller. Route 9 was a double lane road as far as Oak Street. Then there was a massive barrier there that caused some fatalities and the road became only on the south side of the car tracks from there to Worcester. The mode of transportation was the trolley car. It came from Boston and went out to the Natick Junction and ended right there on the corner of the common. And uh, then the buses came in, came roughly the same route, but they came in over Walnut Street. And <clears throat> I know it was a depression time, but nobody knew that at the time. It was never discussed. We didn't know who was and who was not working. We had no idea of the financial strata of most of them. We should have, because Mr. Cashman kept a charge account for virtually everybody in East Natick. Now, who was Mr. Cashman? Mr. Cashman ran a little convenience store uh, on, the turn, on what was now the Turnpike. And uh, everybody charged something. Two packages of camels or Chesterfields or Lucky Strikes, or a quarter milk, uh, fruit or vegetables. Or they had a charge account. And most of them, I guess, never paid. They couldn't afford it. Some of us uh, had eruptions of financial distra uh, dis distress, but we didn't know it until later. Kids. Kids never get into that conversation. Now, did you have brothers and sisters? I have a brother, Neil, <coughs> who's now in, living in Melrose. He's retired a couple of times. And, and I have a sister in Florida who's coming up for that East Natick packing. Really? Yeah. The, the reunion in East Natick? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and what did your dad do? He was an editor for the Associated Press. So, um, not to jump ahead, but it ran in the family, correct? Yes, considerably. It mm -hmm. ran back for many generations, either cops or newspaper people, back to the 1500s. <laughs> and your mom was a housewife? Housewife. <clears throat> when and where did you enter the military? Entered the military from the armory here on East Central Street. Uh, I had been in the National Guard since uh, early 1936. And uh, was talked into joining the company. 
I, uh, under the heading of tangents on our tape here, I had stowed away on an army convoy in 1935 when the National Guard went to Camp Drum, Pine Camp, New York then. And uh, Russell Edwards from East Natick and myself had been selected for the Boy Scout Jamboree in Washington. It was canceled the night before we were to leave because of a polio epidemic. And uh, so we wound up at the Natick Airport. Happened, we happened to know that there was a National Guard convoy going through, and my father had made a few calls, so we stowed away on the trucks. And while we were discovered after we got to New York, and they officially sent us home, we stayed with the Natick outfit until they came home. And, uh, and how old were you at that time? Fifteen. Now, you mentioned the Natick Airport. Some people may not be aware that there right was... behind the Salou bowling alleys. There was an airport. There was an airport, mm -hmm. believe it or not. And before that, there were horse races out in Sunnyside. But and where is Sunnyside? Sunnyside is the uh, intersection of North Main Street and the Route 9 on the far side of that. Which is and, and so did you choose the Army as your branch, or did they choose you? I chose them. Yeah, I was an, an infantry outfit here in Natick, and uh, Natick, at that time, was reputed to have the highest military enrollment in the country at the time. We had five companies in Natick, so a tremendous percentage of the Natick youth were involved in World War II. We were all inducted into federal service from the state service on January 16, 1941, considerably before Pearl Harbor. We were sent down to Camp Edwards in Cape Cod and trained there. We were fleshed out with the first draft people, many of whom were assigned to units near their home unit. So our unit had only 20 or 30 people when we were there because some of them had discharged before federal induction. and. Uh, they filled us up with however many it took in each company uh, to, to flesh them out. And then we went through the basic training cycle again. And where did you have your basic training? In Camp Edwards. Camp Edwards also. Every unit ran its own at the time. Of course, by this time, we had all memorized. <laughs> sure. And, uh, but it was required. So in some cases, four of us did close order drill and right beside the brigade commanders office to shake him up a little bit. Now, did but you have Natick friends join with you? Most of them were already in. Yes is the answer. Some of them came in before or after me. Some came in with the draft and were assigned to our unit. So we did get to know closely, intimately, a tremendous number of people in this area. Meanwhile, the usual number joined the active the regular army, the Navy, Air Force, whatever. Um, ours was a peculiar unit because all of our non-commissioned officers when we left here had reserve commissions because of training they've taken on the side on their own time. So when the federal induction came, all four of our non-commissioned officers became lieutenants in different companies around middle of Massachusetts. And were you one of those? No, I was just a private at the mm -hmm. time. So four of us who had been training for the jobs moved up. So Billy Fitzpatrick became the sergeant major, I became the first sergeant, Jimmy McManus became the supply sergeant, and Ozzy uh, Johnson became the uh, uh, intelligence sergeant. And uh, off we went. Uh, then I stayed in that position until a couple of years while we trained down there. And uh, then I went to officer candidate school in Fort Benning, became a lieutenant. And at what, what age were you at that point? And I was 21 when I went, 22 when I got up. <laughs> Can we just stop the tape one moment? You have a visitor. Let us know. Yeah, in 1942, I went down to Fort Benning to become a, a lieutenant in the infantry. On the presumption I was coming back to the 26th Division, that 
was un impossible because of turmoil that was involving in the Army at the time. The Army was growing faster than it was capable. So uh, I went instead to the 81st Infantry Division, which was basically Georgia, Alabama, reserve type division. And we picked up one third National Guard, one third regular Army, and one third uh, Selective Service or whatever leftovers became a full, one of the many infantry, three divisions that day. So right. at that point in time, were you, were you stationed down in the south? I was stationed at now Fort Rucker, Alabama. And we went from Fort Rucker to the Carolinas for maneuvers to Florida and the swamps, from there to Phoenix, Arizona and the deserts, and from there to San Luis Obispo in California for amphibious training. Nobody knew where we were going, and the North African crusade was still going on. So we were training for anything that we might be needed for. We wound up, uh, I, I left the basic infantry platoon type thing at the time and became a platoon leader of an intelligence and reconnaissance platoon, which is a mixed up volunteer group that did silly things. And uh, I ran a rubber boat school in Hawaii, no, in California. I ran a Jungle Warfare Training Center in Hawaii. Uh, we were the best trained group you ever met. And so you had a lot of training. Oh, all kinds of training. And, and where did that take you? It took us to a terribly long ship ride. For 147 days we spent aboard ship in the first year we were overseas, which is more than most of the Navy. And uh, we learned a lot. We went from Hawaii to a variety of interim stops, including Guadalcanal, which had long since quieted down, then up to uh, the Palau Islands, the island of Angawa and Palau. Can you spell any of those? No, they're on the map. They're right on there. the map. We well, do have a map <laughs> as an aside of the different. Um, it's central. Pa it's in the central Carolines. Thank you. Uh, I spell Palau wrong every time. But we left Palau. My particular reconnaissance unit. We left Palau, and they gave me two destroyers, one for me and one for the underwater demolitions team, and a cruiser for gunfire. And we went up to a place called Ulithi, U-L-I-T-H-I. -I. Uh, we were depriving the Japanese of any movement in that area because Yap was, was 175 miles away from there. Uh, was already overloaded with Japanese. and So we wanted to go to Ulithi and keep them from going any farther. Ulithi was a little atoll, and I went into, in there in D minus three, D minus two, D minus one. And by the time we brought the unit in to invade the place, we did it with locked rifles because I convinced them they weren't going to get shot. We then uh, stayed there for a month and uh, cleaned off every coconut on the island. Um, ran into a typhoon that really wiped out the fleet. The fleet was just coming in from its first raid on Tokyo. And uh, it was really a mess. Uh, we uh, tried to salvage some of their stuff with my rubber boats, which don't sink in typhoons, mm. and um, they wouldn't let us, because my sergeant first escapade was to go down after a sunken airplane and he stole, he stole the admiral's laundry in a case of scotch, and that was a sin, so we uh, were forbidden to go near the Navy ships. But meanwhile, we uh, went from there back to Palau. And uh, that was when the 1st Marine Division was trying to clean it up and our division was helping and we were gradually relieving the 1st Marine Division. Was there a lot of interaction between you and the Marines? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, it depended on the task force, who was going where. But almost all task forces had combinations of Marines and Army in the Middle Pacific. They were not like MacArthur's Army coming up through the uh, the island chain closer to the uh, Asian coast, uh, they were hitting individual islands, and depending on its size, 
For example, Iwo Jima had a Marine Division and two Army Divisions. Uh, there were all kinds of what's called inter interlocking. It's not right. It's a it's a uh, joint. Is the word I was looking for. Mm -hmm. A joint command type of thing, mostly by admirals. Until we got, we stayed on. Ulithi until we all got that, uh, uh, what do you call it? I got shot on Ulithi, and, no, I got shot on Pelabu, excuse me. Um, it banged me up considerably. I ran the platoon from my hospital bed. I was in one of the first, what you know as MASH, as a portable army surgical hospital. It's a 25-bed surgical hospital, um, right beside a Navy counterpart hospital. And uh, it was a 25-bed hospital, but we had 125 surgical patients, Army, Navy, Marines, anybody. Um, so that those who were ambulatory, me in a week or two, uh, had to help out in the operating rooms. <laughs> so you were injured, you were sent to a, a hospital? And which was only 500 yards up the beach. But uh, yeah, I was gradually dragged out of the point of impact and taken up the beach uh, to the Portable Army Surgical Hospital, which had two doctors and a dentist and a handful of troops. The mail clerk became the floor orderly. The, drive, the, the captain's driver became a, an, a, an assistant in the operating room. And then as soon as you were ambulatory, you also assisted? Yeah. Uh, yeah I held my only man in my platoon who had been hit beside me he shot, lost his finger in a uh, landmine, setting a landmine. So um, they were cutting the thing off and deciding how to do it, and the thumb was hanging down here someplace. And the doctor said, Tave, if you throw up, I'll kick your butt. And so I didn't. I held his arm like this and stared at it while they sewed it together. But the uh, then I still needed some more hospitalization. So after Christmas in 44, where we had a magnificent party, I might as well tell you about the party, because it was, it was not abnormal. There's always humor in the military. They have to be or they go crazy. We were going to have in the company, and it's, it was still in the front lines, but we were going to relieve them one platoon at a time and come back to the base mess hall area mess tent to uh, have a party. So the officers were getting a, a quart of whiskey a, a, a week, a month, or whatever, month. And uh, the enlisted men were getting a case of beer every now and then. And we hadn't gotten any for seven months, so all of a sudden I wound up with seven bottles of booze. And we decided we were going to use one, and give one of the non-coms, give one of the, and gave most of it away. But one of it went to this company party. We poured it in big 15-gallon Marmite cans, and uh, I stole, I borrowed <laughs> two gallons of med medicinal alcohol from the hospital and some ice. We had the only ice machine on the island that was in the hospital, and uh, so we had a great party. They fell in with canteen cups and went through this mess. I mean, we just poured all kinds of the booze into the Marmite cans, and then put lemon juice, grapefruit juice, uh, apple juice, whatever, orange juice, whatever juice came in the little pa packets in our rations, and made a palatable, potable, no, almost portable punch. Fell in with the canteen cups, and on the second trip around, they started falling down. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Uh, the tree was made of two by fours with typewriter tape as <laughs> ornaments, and, and how then. Huh? How was your health at that time? I was on a, a, a bed, the thing that held the canvas caught in the end as of my cane. I had a patch on my left hip about that big. So they put me in a marine airplane with a shaky wing, I'll never forget it, and flew me to Guadalcanal to, for recuperation because my outfit was going to stop there on the way down to New Caledonia for rest camp because we all had uh, dysentery at the time, amoebic dysentery and it lost incredible poundage. I, I think it was down 125 pounds. And, and your norm was what? 
140, 100, anyway, lost 20 to 50 pounds. And so they flew us down as a rest camp. We'd been in contact with the bad guys for a couple of three months by that time. And, uh, so we went down to New Caledonia, and uh, in exchange for making a speech to any NCO or officers club, I got the use of a Jeep um, and free meals. So I met two of the most interesting characters I met in the war there that had not left Guadalcanal throughout the entire war. They just hit off in the jungle. There was a British, an Australian major and a New Zealand captain. And uh, when they finally got so they could trust me, they uh, had me follow them with the fuzzy wuzzies. It was a big native people with the hair like this and the auburn. And uh, then we walked uh, from here to that flagpole and down through a jungle trail as the fuzzy wuzzies were finishing work that day. They were rebuilding Henderson Field, which had an airport there. In New had, Caledonia? No, this, this was is in Guadalcanal. In Guadalcanal, I'm yeah. sorry. Mm -hmm. And they had, uh, they were working as laborers on the field, and then they'd go back to their villages at night. Well, they, we stayed with the Fuzzy Wuzzies about from here to the flagpole, and he looked around and said, jump left, and I jumped left in the jungle, the uh, coony grass, big high grass, and it opened up to a trail about that wide. I went from here to the middle of Clark's Block uh, through that trail and came up in a room just about this size, carved right smack, straight walls, four sides, in the jungle, and a, a teak wood bar that ran from me to Tom. <laughs> nothing on it, but they had nothing else to do. So they, they had hid from the Japanese for three years. <laughs> oh, my. And did anyone in their units know that they were even alive? No. No, they were the coast watchers that showed up in the movies and all that stuff. Okay. They, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, they, they were legitimate coast watchers. And now, you're in your mid-twenties at this point in time, correct? Take, yeah. What was it like meeting up with all these... Um, Foreigners? <laughs> exactly. A, a young man from Newton, then Natick, going over and meeting all sorts of different I had become used to that because as we started the maneuvers pre-war, we found that the Confederate flag was very much flying in places we went and we didn't understand it at all. I can remember visiting a delightful family in Fayetteville, North Carolina, and uh, the two little ladies sat on the couch like you and uh, Finally, they opened their mouth and said, you're the first Yankees that have been in here since the war, the war. Um, of course, in there, it's the war between the states, not the Civil War. And they were absolutely amazed that the town had asked them to host Yankee soldiers. So the three of us sat there very uncomfortable <laughs> and uh, had chat. But uh, that brought up the fact that we were running into the Southerners, the Texans, the Californians, Wherever we went, we were running into a subculture that we didn't understand. Mm -hmm. And we had to learn it. We had to get along with them. I can remember in Georgia, the uh, night before we were graduated, we'd sneaked off to have a little pop, and uh, a black guy had the effrontery to put his arm around my shoulder and say, we're graduating tomorrow. And he was promptly whipped almost to death by the other people in the bus stop. And uh, it, then I w it was explained to me, and this poor guy was a master in the Boston Conservatory and was playing bass fiddle in Boston Symphony Orchestra. He had never been south of South Boston, but because he was black, he was hammered on. Those, I had to learn that in a hurry because I was, had been a first sergeant dealing with mixed cultures, and uh, that was that was the way life was, whether, whatever country, whether you met him in Australia or Japan. Or, uh, now, did you have any long-lasting friendships? Oh, uh, yes. With uh, World War II? From World War II, yes. Some of whom I still maintain contact uh, with the usual Christmas card list. A few I meet in Natick when I come down here twice a year. 
Vet Memorial Day, Veterans Day, uh, not counting relatives. We might add that Mr. Tom Carr is sitting in listening to this interview. Tom is a Natick resident and a very good friend of Dick Tafe. Thank you for that. Yeah. So anyway, uh, when I left Guadalcanal, I went down to New Caledonia where we rebuilt a beach that had been pretty well chewed up and named one of the beaches for my good buddy, my best buddy in the war, who had been in my wedding party as had Tom, and uh, Bill Murphy, a genius I knew from Quincy. Um, Bill got his tail shot off, got killed in, in Peleliu before I, while well, I was still up at Ulithi. But they sent a special envoy up to tell me about it. How was that? I mean, one of your good friends, someone that... Yeah, they buried him in a sandbag because they couldn't get his body out for three weeks. Hey. And then you just had to go forward in yeah. spite of that loss. Oh, sure. What was it like? You get used to it. The hard part there is writing a letter to the mother. Mm -hmm. And I've done it too many times to remember. Uh, that's the difficult part of that. As a, as a leader, you have to take care of your men. If you lose your men, whether it's in a boating accident or a traffic accident or in combat, the commander is supposed to send a nice letter of sorts to the next of kin. That ain't easy. No. Uh, I found it most difficult. And after writing, when you came back to the States, did you ever follow up with a visit, or was that difficult also? Uh, yeah, we did in the early, in the late 40s, we still tried to run into each other now and then. Those of us who had a direct link to one or the other adventures we'd been through. And uh, well, I can remember driving out to only on to New York and seeing a lieutenant and his wife that we had served with. I met a guy down in Long Island that was working for a newspaper in New York and uh, we stayed in touch with him pretty well. My platoon sergeant interrupts me every now and then with a phone call from nowhere. You know, I haven't seen him for umpteen years, but he'll call me from Florida one year, from Oregon the next year, and tell me what he's been doing. And he, he was one of my real best guys. I, the guy you have to learn to trust with your life. That's a distinct thing that infantrymen learn in Ari. Can I trust him? And when you can, you turn your back when you're working and you know you're going to be okay because mm -hmm. he's watching your back. Now, backing up a little, you had mentioned um, I believe that Mr. Murphy was stood up for you in your wedding? Yeah, he was an usher at my wedding. So when did you get married? I got married between OCS and my first assignment in 10 days. I went from Georgia to Massachusetts, got time to be married, and went back to Alabama. And your wife stayed here? Mm -mm. She went to Alabama with you? Well, she went down. I sent her home from New York, and then she came down a week later after I'd found a place to live. So what was it like for her while you were It was horrifying. The poor girl had never been out of Massachusetts. As a matter of fact, she had once. She'd gone down to New York to see some guy that uh, died this week that sings. And uh, he, uh, she, otherwise she'd never, never left Brighton. Uh, she was really a recluse as far as that. She, uh, she got on the train with the greatest patience and fortitude that you could imagine and found her way to the middle of Alabama in a place that the railroad people didn't even know where it was at the time. Bummed a ride in an army truck. I missed the train. So uh, I'm looking for her, she's looking for me. And she had adventures like that all through the war, because when we went, we went, and she found her way to the next stop. Mm -hmm. She carried the five-week-old baby, the youngest baby at the time to make a transcontinental flight, to uh, Phoenix, Arizona, from Boston. Um, I lost her for a week there. Um, then she found her way from there to California and stood on the sidewalk as we drove by and said, we live there. I didn't know where that was, but we found her. Uh, I sent her home from California when I was marshaled to go to 
on the seas. And uh, she didn't see me again until I wandered home after uh, the Japanese surrender, after the occupation of Japan. Now, I know, and the audience certainly doesn't know, that you basically made this service a career. This is correct. Why don't you tell us a little bit about after the World War II? After World War II, I had some fascinating jobs. I don't know why, but somebody liked me. I was the Assistant State Public Affairs Officer for Massachusetts for a few years. During the Korean War, I ran the Army newspaper section for the Chief of Staff of the Army and the Office of Chief of Information. 750 newspapers, including the Stars and Stripes, and all the Army Armed Forces radio service stations. But and where were you stationed at that time? The this Pentagon. is during, at the Pentagon during the Korean War. During the Korean War, that was it, yeah. And your yeah. family was with you? They were in Virginia, yeah, Northern Virginia. Fort Myer. We lived in what is now the corner, the lower corner of Arlington Cemetery. It uh, was then the south post of Fort Myer. Yeah, we stayed there for a couple, three, four years. We went from there to Panama, and I ran the first television station in Panama. And uh, the education program from Texas to Chile, and by way of Puerto Rico, from fourth grade through graduate school. Um, then I went to, I'm forgetting some school times in there. And I went to Arabia for a year and was a budget officer, <laughs> telling the Arabs how to spend $110 million. Uh, uh, now, when you went to Arabia, could your family go with you? No, that was a. And what year was that? 59, no, 60. 1969. 59, I had a battalion up at Fort Devens here. Um, and what was your rank at that point in 1960? I was a major then. Going to Arabia, this was at a time, you were said a budget officer, and this was during a peaceful time for you. More or less. Mm -hmm. um, during the Korean War, you were involved with reporting the news. No, I was reading things that had been reported. Okay. The only thing I reported, quote unquote, was Eisenhower's election. I worked out a deal to get it simultaneously transmitted throughout the world. Now, during that period of time, did you travel overseas or were you? Yes, I went to Korea to set up the post hostilities plan on radio, television, and education. Uh, I went out to Desert Rock to cover the nuclear blasts. You did. Uh, <laughs> I well, told you I had a whole fascinating bunch of good assignments. Now, what was that like? It was uh, just as they describe it uh, a lot of noise and uh, a lot of apprehension. Uh, Were you as aware of what was going to happen prior yes. to it happening? Oh yeah, I wrote an I, I wrote an off unclassified article based on classified data in Collier's magazine. As a matter of fact, lead article for "I'm Not Afraid of the A Bomb." It said. Can we get a copy of that article? If I look far enough, I probably have one. <laughs> so you're a major in the army in 1960. Ah uh, yeah. And at that point in time, there, there must have been some dealings with Vietnam. Not really. Uh, in that time, I, not, I did know about it, because in 1958, before I went to Panama, no, 54, before I went to Panama, I had written the annual report of the Secretary of the Army to the White House and the State Department, uh, to the President. And uh, we had to put a chapter in about Vietnam. But otherwise, I knew little about it because I was too involved in other wars and other incidents worldwide, uh, which got to be a much more comprehensive bit after I got back from Arabia. Um, then it was time to get involved with the Kennedy administration. I went into Washington the day after inauguration and spent the next five years, my last five years there in the Pentagon. Were you involved with the Kennedy administration directly? Yes. What was I that? I had uh, a 
White House pass for the next eight years. Um, I ran for the White House, State Department, Defense Department, and USIA press tours of foreign and U.S. press worldwide, wherever they went. And I generally didn't go. I sent escorts with them. But sometimes I went along with them to see what it was like. In going along with some of those, who were some of the most, what were some of the most fascinating, fascinating remembrances that you might have? Getting into Berlin with the Audubon closed. Um, things like that. Uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, fascinating week. Uh, was it a tension-filled week? Oh, God. More than you could think, because the world doesn't stop when you have a Cuban Missile Crisis. I had 72 delegates, ministerial level, from 33 countries in Washington, D.C., running the first ever in the U.S. annual meeting of CISM, Conseil du Militaire Sports, Military Sports Council, CISM. And uh, we were uh, filled up with all kinds of programs, and I had 50,000 bucks of their money in my pocket to find things for them to do, and rented the whole two floors of a hotel, and we were going fine, until all of a sudden the whistle blew, and I had to get rid of the money and find things to keep these guys out of any knowledge of what was going on in the White House. We had a meeting at the State Department, and they put a curtain down the, ball, the major room up on the sixth floor, seventh floor, wherever it was. And uh, I, the president was on that side of the curtain. I had my gang on this side of the curtain, and we couldn't let them eat. He'd know. I let Salinger know I was there. He let me know I couldn't come over his side of the curtain. And uh, that was a, a, quite a thing. Uh, we had a, a banquet at Fort Myer that Friday night, and I had to keep changing the place cards. I had brass, uh, silver plates made for them with the map of the U.S. and all this good stuff. And uh, I, had to, I had four young servicemen uh, and women uh, changing the plate settings as General XYZ had to stay in the White House Situation Room to keep track of what was going on in Cuba. Anyway, we survived that bit. Uh, yeah, I ran the press box at the K Kennedy funeral. Because Salinger was halfway across the Pacific. W was that an emotional time for you terribly, and your crew? Terribly, yeah. It was, yeah. I didn't sleep for four days. I didn't get home. I got home a couple of hours watch what was going on on television. But, well, I know, uh, I'm sure we can all identify with where were you when it happened, and it was such a remarkable piece of history. We were all stunned, but to be so closely involved in I it. I was coming back from lunch, and my Navy chief petty officer came running down the corridor knowing where I was going to lunch in the Pentagon and yelled at me, come quick to the boss's office. And then he whispered as we went by, the president's been shot. So I get in there, and the boss said, get a plane. Every plane was tied up instantly, and especially a missions plane, except uh, I called on the hotline and got um, General LeMay's plane. <laughs> Nobody had thought about that one. And I was getting ready and loaded people to go to Dallas and re realized we'd pass Air Force One coming back. So I said, no, you guys want to go to Dallas, go up to Friendship and grab your own plane. I'll give you a bus. But we're staying here, so we stayed there. The, uh, the incidents in that era, the Kennedy era, were many and much more serious than most people realized. We had uh, the Dominican Republic at the time. We had the Chinese invading Kashmir at the time. We had Greek, uh, Greece and Turkey fighting, Nicaragua and Honduras, uh, all kinds of world turmoil that I had to send somebody to. Sometimes it was just an earthquake. I had to send a team to help set up the shelters. Uh, it uh, was fascinating. and. Interesting, the most fascinating, interesting time I've ever had probably in my life. Um, 
In the same way with Lyndon, when he came along, Lyndon Johnson was a, an entirely different type. But I can remember his inaugural ball, for example. I spotted the Secret Service coming in. So I got my gang and a, an African tour in town at the time, 20 African journalists. So I decided to round them up and stand them right here. Don't move from right there. And sure enough, in came Lyndon and stood right there. <laughs> we, uh, th that type of thing you, you had a lot of fun with. You know. Was it remarkably different, though, going from a Kennedy to a Johnson overnight? Yes. Did it impact your job tremendously? No. He didn't know I existed. Mm -hmm. I have one picture I can't find. And the preceding the Dallas trip, the president took, he did a West Coast trip. And I took a foreign journalist, NATO gang, diagonally across the same route, following him by a, a few miles, but in a slower plane than Air Force One. So uh, we got to Holloman, one of the bases we stopped at en route, and I got a picture of Johnson and Kennedy doing this to me as I stood there with my silly camera. They went, one went on each side and left. They, uh, they, uh, I had a trouble on the other end of that, standing at the San Diego Marine Corps training base, waiting for a ride to the base from the airport. And everybody, we just finished loading the baggage off of Air Force One onto a, another Air Force plane so we could move it up to where our next morning stop was going to be in Vandenberg. Now I'm standing there with no place to go, and I can see the Marine Depot over there, and the President's on a political tour down through the road, down through the town, and I got to be there before he is. So I, I said to a Marine Major that's standing up against the fence, who was waiting, I knew he was waiting for somebody, I said, can I bum a ride from you over there? And he says, Colonel, I can't let you. I said, I, he said, I got to pick up the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs right here. And I said, where is he? He said, I don't know. He's going to come in. So I walked over to the corner of Air Force One. There's always a, near, a telephone there. And I called him. I said, he's on up over Vandenberg and flight number, tail number, what's a, and he'll be here in 25 minutes. Uh, he said, how do you find that out? I said, I don't know. Let's see. I went from here to the cockpit, and the cockpit to the White House, and the White House to SAC base, and SAC, SAC uh, The communication was even good then. But you had the right connections to make those communications. My best connection in Washington at that time was I could call the special air missions people and order an airplane without telling them who I was. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, uh, it was fun. Very much fun. Very busy. You know, you're working 75 hours a week. and I missed a few days of leave here and there. And family, I'm sure. Yes. I call them every day from wherever. What were some of your greatest challenges looking back at your remarkable career? Challenges? Decisions whether to go back into Moscow, uh, into Berlin on a particular time we were just flown out and Stalin had closed the Autobahn again and it was raining like crazy. And I finally got somebody to get me off the hook because the press wanted to go back in. I had a U.S. press, the Defense and White House press, on that trip. And uh, we'd gone to Paris, Bonn, Berlin, Naples, Rome. Fun and games trip. Um, I talked to everybody, ambassadorial or general officer level in the whole group. Even uh, in Naples, we got them to have a meeting for us on Sunday. <laughs> Uh, How about some memorable characters? You had mentioned your Australian memorable major. Memorable characters, your all right. Captain. Uh, Red Grandy. Red Grandy is a prize-winning photographer for Stars and Stripes Europe who came to the U.S. of A. for the Eisenhower inaugural and got away with walking across Pennsylvania Avenue at the White House diagonally to talk to a Secret Service agent and the president says he's okay, leave him. 
And he's the only guy on that side of the street, got some great pictures, stayed at my house for the inauguration. And I called him that night, we were going back into Berlin, and he advised against the tour. <laughs> he was an interesting character. He, he took the famous I'll Be Damned picture of, of, Mac of uh, Eisenhower when MacArthur relieved, I remember when Truman relieved MacArthur. And he took that very famous picture. There were 25 photographers there, and he got the only one that had the facial expression of the general who didn't believe that the president would do it. Uh, the, uh, you had mentioned to me prior to the start of this interview that you were in the service for 29 years. Yes. And when were you discharged? Or I got out in February 1966. I could have stayed longer uh, and been promoted. But I had one kid in Philadelphia, in Pennsylvania, one in Iowa, one in Indiana. And in they college? Didn't, in college. They did not pay for holiday transport. They, they do now. And I was on orders to the language school at the Presidio of Monterey, and then to go down back again down to Panama. And I knew the guy I was going to be working for in Panama, and I said, I might as well get out now and uh, enjoy life. And you, in 1966, you were discharged at what rank? Lieutenant Colonel. Lieutenant Colonel. Then did you stay involved after that in any? Well, for three years, I was the managing editor of the Northern Virginia Sun, which is right across the river behind Arlington Cemetery. Um, and I had White House credentials then. Um, so I was staying involved, yes, in that sense. And then in 1968, I came up to Lowell, Massachusetts, and edited their paper for seven or eight years. During this career, did you go to college? I went to five of them. <laughs> but I never slowed up long enough to get a degree. <laughs> I'm sorry to say. But you must have had a strength in writing or? I guess. I don't know. I. Uh, I did some. Well, you were a managing editor in Lowell for how many years? Seven, uh, seven years. When you returned, where, do, where did you return to? I returned to Arlington, Virginia. Virginia. I went home. They had a retirement ceremony at Fort Myer and, uh, with the honor guard and all those guys. And uh, then just went home. My family was there. and. Uh, what was it like for them, all of a sudden, having you back there. Traumatic. Uh, the kids took it in stride because they're army brats. They've been through it, been so many places. Most of the time when I was overseas, they were in the United States, wherever. Once we got overseas together, which was in Panama for three years, great three years. And when was that? 55 to 58. So the whole family was there? Yeah. And they went to school there? They went to school there. They had three horses to play with. They um, got involved in Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts and did all those nice things. That everybody loved Panama. We really did. So you said the kids took it in stride when you returned. What yeah, because they they knew where I'd been and what I've done, and I couldn't impress them with any stories. They, you know, where'd you go this time, Dad? Or who's on the phone? Some guy in Calcutta. Uh, you know, it was that type of family. They uh, just got used to it. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Now, what about your wife? What was it like for her suddenly? I drove a busload of VIPs, non-English speaking, mm -hmm. with a State Department translator, up my driveway one time and said, can we feed them, honey? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I had to kill two hours before we went to the next meeting, <laughs> wherever it was. <laughs> Sure, she said. So she expected the unexpected? Very much good, well put, yes. She mm -hmm. expected the unexpected. And whatever I brought home, living or dead, <laughs> she took care of. Yeah. Yeah. How important was serving in the military to you? And as a second question, how do you feel it affected the rest of your life, especially because you were in for so many years, 29 years? I've never quite caught up with the question as to whether or not I'm a soldier on loan to the journalism field or a journalist 
a newspaper man, I don't use the word journalist, um, on loan to the Army. Because I've had you know, 35 years in journalism and I've had 29 years, that's two lifestyles, and I've spent the last 30 years as a volunteer in the city of Lowell doing everything you can imagine. That's another whole lifetime. You don't want to get involved. Well, I know you had mentioned being very involved with the Boy Scouts. Boy Scouts, Red Cross, Association, U.S. Army. I run the Lowell Folk Festival, which is the largest folk festival in the United States last weekend in July. Come up and see it. Which folk festival is it, Lowell? Lowell Folk Festival. I'm, actually, I, I'm lying when I say I run it. I did run it for 20 years, but now I'm graduated to emeritus status, so they keep me out of the way. I ride around the golf cart and say, geez, you're doing great. <laughs> what did you think then, and by then I mean ba basically back when you first joined during World War II, and what do you think now regarding the war efforts? And I say efforts in this because you were in... It's a, a very complicated answer. In World War II, there was no question that the entire country was involved. Rosie the Riveter was just as important as the guy on the shipyard and the soldier, sailor, airman, and marine. Or the civilians that hosted them at dances or things like that. It was a total world war effort. And almost anywhere in the world you went, you could find Errors. Tom was up in the China Burma India Theater. He didn't particularly know or care what was happening in North Africa, southern France, or Europe. They had their job. Our gang in the Middle Pacific didn't care what MacArthur was doing in the Southwest Pacific. Uh, he was he doing his job, and Admiral, uh, what's his name? <laughs> uh, he uh, he did his job. The uh, Next war was kind of a forgotten war. It's been so stated since now. If at that time the United States knew what Task Force Smith faced when they moved from Japan over to Korea when the invasion started, they'd be still running congressional hearings. Task Force Smith was the remnants of two leftover regiments, under-equipped, under-uniformed, under supplied in absolutely uh, nothing more than warm bodies under a lieutenant colonel who went over to try to stop the North Korean army. Terrible. They got pushed out of that little pocket in, near the Pusan before anybody realized that we were going to lose that war. So that's when MacArthur, of course, ran the famous Incheon, Incheon invasion and cut the Koreans in half, but the public didn't appreciate that. The invasion did get a lot of muscle, but then MacArthur made the mistake of trying to outthink the president and got himself fired. And uh, that was probably the only knowledge that the general public got was the MacArthur firing. And the, you know, the, the famous uh, old soldiers never die, they just fade away. That is not a MacArthur right. That's in words of a song that the military has been playing for 100 years. I think it's a Sousa match, as a matter of fact. Anyway, uh, so that was the forgotten war. It's, it's been noticed even more now than then. The Korean War, because everybody was being treated as an individual rather than a unit. See, my unit stayed together. I stayed with the same platoon for almost five years in World War II. But nothing happened for longer than a year in Vietnam. The, uh, they went as individuals, they counted days, when can I go home? In Vietnam. In Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, they, they liked or didn't like the commanders or the soldiers beside them, but unfortunately, because they were being abused by the general public when the pro protests really got going, they all individually went into a shell, a denial. And that's why you find many Vietnam veterans today still having trouble discussing the subject. 
or where they were or what they were. I've had people apply to me for work who uh, wouldn't admit that they were in Vietnam. I had a great young fellow show up one day and he worked his tail off, very good. Found out a year later he was a captain in Vietnam in the infantry. Didn't like to talk didn't about it. Didn't want to die. Didn't ever mention it. <laughs> Once you found out about that and you spoke to him about it, yeah. did he open up to you at yeah, all? Yeah, after that, then you, you got a, a quid pro quo. You, you know, you, they know what you're talking about, and if you know what you're talking about, you can talk with anybody. Uh, and do you feel that it was because of the negative feelings once he returned? I never quite saw all the negative feelings, which I think really have been blown out of proportion to a degree by the media. Some of the media, of course, won their Pulitzer Prizes by being obstructionists, <laughs> a subject I'm not particularly happy with, but because uh, it was my job to send press to Vietnam. Uh, who in their right mind would take a job in Vietnam when they were married and had a family and all this stuff? The answer was nobody. So they got people from Australia and Canada and bought them big insurance policies and they became anchors on network and you'd never heard of them before. And they won Pulitzer Prizes by digging into some things that they should have dug into. I'm not quarreling on the stories. Me lie should have been written about, and it was, and uh, all that good stuff. But we used to meet in Hawaii with the crew coming up from Saigon and the crew coming in from Washington. And we'd spend a couple, three days just comparing notes, who was doing what to whom. And many of the media at that time would not go to the five o'clock follies, which was called, the, the news briefing every day was called that. We rotated the boss of that back and forth to Washington every six months, the general and the colonel. And they did their job well. But how can you write about a war if you don't know how it's going from the official side? You can find them the, the worm's eye view by talking to Joe Soldier. And Ernie Pyle did that very successfully during World War II. But, uh, well, he had to file through a chain of different islands two or three days late. These guys are in your living room with the six o'clock news. And you couldn't rebut them because that's a bunch of bull. They, they, you know, they decided what was good and what wasn't bad, what was bad. And uh, unfortunately, that hurt the country, it hurt the army, and it hurt some specific individuals. Uh, yeah, I wrote something a couple of years ago about Westmoreland. And he called me up the next morning, chewing my tail. I was on his side, he didn't realize it. But anyway. Uh, Is it that he didn't agree with the I was editorial? Misquoting, I was quoting somebody else from a preceding era. Uh, the quote was right, but it was the wrong guy. Yeah. I, the theory was the same, but uh, anyway. Uh, no, those Hawaiian trips were terribly important. We really, and we ran into, what do we say about type things? Well, since then, there's been a corridor in the Pentagon named for correspondence, a correspondence corridor. It's uh, General Floyd Parks, uh, who was the chief of information in the Korean War, um, was named for him, and the little alcove up there is the, the, the war correspondent from the Baltimore Sun who had been in World War I, uh, old, old guy. So they did credit them and they have listed all the correspondents that died. But then you were getting, you had an official position and a fact. For example, Dickie Chappelle was a female correspondent. Dickie Chappelle fought with me for a year to get a bummer ride from the United States to Vietnam. I kept turning her down because I wasn't flying anybody else. If she got in theater, as far as Hawaii, I could do anything she wanted, but I couldn't do it from the United States to the theater. She wanted to buy a Marine at a training camp and a rifle at a manufacturing plant, marry them up in the country and take them to a patrol in Vietnam. 
Well, she did. I don't know how she got around me, but she did. Congratulations to her. And she wound up doing exactly what she wanted to do and stepped on the mine and got killed. Now, how do I explain that? Because okay. officially, I had said no, she couldn't go. Mm -hmm. Unofficially, I'm for applauding her. She did a great job of her story. But she had done the same thing in Korea, jumped on a beach that she wasn't supposed to jump out of somebody's airplane that wasn't supposed to lend her a parachute. What is your sense with your um, newspaper background, your editorial background, of the recent wars now where we're literally seeing the war on television happening right before us, whereas in your era it was written, sent, and then the next day or two days later we saw it in the There's local paper. There's been no field press censorship since World War II. The immediacy of the news requires the military to come up with a much faster response capability of the official, the big picture. The, the day of the young hotshot reporter looking for his Pulitzer Prize at well, no, ex no expense. He doesn't care who he hurts. Unfortunately, there are still some of them around. You see, a couple of months, 60 minutes every week. But the, I don't think it's fair to show a dead body to a mother who has a kid there. It might be hers. And that's the only thing that the military would like to, not censor, but review in a sense of appropriate response. If the cops in this town say the name of the victim was not released until they notify the next of kin, there is absolutely no question. But in the military operation, they want to show the picture of the guy chewed up in some form or another today, right now, on the news. You can't censor me. You're right, we can't censor you. There had no, been, no field, sense, field press censorship since World War II. So that's a diff difficulty thing. It's a difficult thing in the newspaper side, too. You get five people thrown in the river from an accident and you're pulling them out, you don't show the bodies mm. in a family newspaper. You do in some papers, but it's not fun. Mm. Looking back on your remarkable career, is there one thought or one memory that you would like to share, not only with your family, but with the community at large? and? with the future generations who we know will be looking at these tapes. Yes. There is. Right now, the military has been cut more than a third in the last couple of years. They have taken the entire infrastructure of a city like Cleveland and thrown it out. It's the lowest point the military has been in as a percentage of the national budget or numbers since before World War II. We're expected to be able to fight two wars, two theater-type wars at the same time, as well as these things never before called on the humanitarian-type wars, Bosnia, um, wherever else, it's all over the world. We have troops today in 100 countries. Nobody knows that. Um, 116 to be exact. The, they're all doing an important job. And now people are nibbling at that defense budget. It used to be 6% of the gross national. It's now 3%. It's now, as I say, the lowest billion dollar mark since before the World War II. And the, the mission requirements are much greater. In those days, only, well, one-fifth, one out of five was functionally illiterate, as was the whole country. The whole country still is, but the Army has 100% high school diploma level. At, in those days, the officer corps only had 25% with degrees. Now they have 
multiple degrees. They have master's degrees. If they stick in, if they stay in, otherwise they get thrown out. It's the smartest army in the history of the world. And it's being asked to do more than any other army in its past. High technology is coming, yes. They have already digitized uh, a brigade. They're going to digitize a, a whole division before 19, uh, 2002. The public doesn't appreciate this. I'm involved with the Association of the United States Army, which only job is to educate the public about the terrible problem that the military is facing now. You know, we were on a 600-ship Navy for a while, and now we're spending more on a, another carrier that some people don't think they really need, uh, and they're down to 300 ships. Then the Air Force, the Navy, and the Marines all have, and the Army, all have plane, fighter plane support. But why are they dealing with three planes instead of one? Um, the next few years will be the most important in the military's history because if it goes down much farther, it'll be back to the 1970s hollow army. If it maintains its progress forward with new equipment, new maintenance systems, and fewer unnecessary bases, which is true, then uh, we're in trouble. And there, I put a period. Well, after that period, we would like to thank you very much. This was a most rewarding afternoon, full of information. We appreciate the time you took with us today. Glad I could. Thank you.